I can't wait for my appointment I've been brushing up on my lines There will be no disappointment At what she finds this time She won't have to count the losses Of a guy who never flosses I've arrived here at the office of my dentist Hi Jennifer Hi Janice And you know it makes me chuckle she turns those gases on Then she probes my distal buckle With that sexy cabotron She don't want no wild adventure Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm Dr. Gary Severance with Henry Shine, and I'm very excited for the program tonight and happy National Dental Hygiene Month to you all. We have two great presenters tonight, and I know it's a very interesting topic when we look at you know, the new research and strategies to maintain healthy hands, elbows, and shoulders. And I think we're gonna see a new product as well. If you have any questions tonight, please uh, ask them in the Q&A panel. There is a chat panel too, but we're gonna focus on the Q&A at the end of the program. So if you have questions for the presenters, please place them there. There is no CE for this course, but we do wanna thank you, Freedy, for the sponsorship. And if you have any large programs running on your computer while watching this program, it may slow down the program, so you may wanna quit out of those. Tonight we have obviously, as I said, a great program, and I'm very excited to see the content and the message delivered. We have Cindy Purdy, a uh, registered dental hygienist, and Edie Gibson, also a registered dental hygienist, that are going to provide information not only on themselves, but the profession of hygiene. With that, I'll turn it over to you two ladies. Good evening. Good evening. How is everybody? Uh, I wish we could see you guys. I don't know about you, but I know Cindy and I are truly missing our profession and being able to see each other in person, especially with this amazing month called Dental Hygiene Month. So kudos to everyone here on my hygiene crew. So I am sitting here behind a mic and my name is Edie Gibson. And you can see, as Gary had said, I'm a registered dental hygienist. I have a master's in psychology and practiced clinically for many, many years. And ergonomics is near and dear to my heart. And I am humbled, honored, and blessed to be on this presentation with one of my ergonomic mentors and teachers, Miss Cindy Purdy, who is coming from us, which I'm so jealous of, from a mountaintop in Southern Colorado, and her home is truly majestic. So Cindy, I am like seriously jealous that you are in my heart home, Colorado. Well, the only reason I'm um, glad that y'all can't see me is Edie always makes me turn red when she, she's so kind to say <laughs> these things, and I, I feel the same about her. Um, I know that Edie's heart um, will always be in Colorado, but at this moment, she's currently coming to us from Edmond, Oklahoma. I am indeed. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And for my note-taking hygienists, which are probably all y'all, <laughs> here are the course objectives. So we're gonna learn a lot. We're gonna understand, appreciate, and learn a whole bunch of stuff about ergonomics and some risk factors leading to um, injury. We're gonna learn about some science-based ergonomics evidence when it comes to a new product launched by Hugh Freedy that Cindy and I have been super excited about. And I've been blessed to be on the ground floor with this, um, the beginning of this instrument. So it's pretty cool that we get to actually present that to you tonight. And we're also gonna talk a lot about ergonomics. It's all about ergonomics. So it's not only about one product, it's about the practice of staying healthy. And so here are course objectives. Feel free to take a picture. If you are going through here, you can screenshot, um, take pictures of slides. We're cool with that. Um, we really want you to, Sit back, enjoy, and we hope you learn a lot. 
So Edie and I, and of course you free, the Hefridi group and Henry Shine, we're, we, are, we all want to celebrate you, not only because it's National Dental Hygiene Month, but more importantly, because you are our front, our dental frontline heroes. So we will be celebrating you throughout this whole presentation. And what did you think of that opening movie? Ooh. I re I loved it. Um, it was kind of a spur of the moment idea, um, but with everybody's efforts, it quickly became a reality. Um, a few days ago, maybe a week ago now, I asked hygienists on a social media page to share their pictures um, donning their new PPE. And I was so appreciative of how eagerly all of these lovely ladies so willingly helped me out. And with the magic and mad technical skills of our Shine host tonight, Dr. Gary Severance, this movie was the result. Like I said, I love it, and I think it sets a great vibe for the start of the fun and education that Edie and I are planning to share with you guys tonight. Without a doubt. I loved that movie. I was, I was dancing in my seat back here, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, the coronavirus has forced us all to rethink and retool everything about our lives and our jobs. Um, but from the beginning of this mess, I knew that science would be the answer. I mean, I've read studies um, at, the at the University, I think of Chicago or Illinois, where they're, they're developing a polymer to add to our ultrasonic water that doesn't create an aerosol. I mean, science is going to pull us through this, you guys. And with this, with this presentation, we're going to focus a lot on the recent science advancements that Hugh Friedi has made in the dental instrument design and then the structure. And I want to be completely transparent here. Um, I know I'm speaking to clinical dental hygienists, but since COVID, I have made the decision to retire from my clinical practice after 40 years. Mm. Yeah, and, and these little ladies are the reason why. Um, we have a family immunity issue, and I am not willing to give up my time with my granddaughters. And in addition, after 40 years of clinical hygiene, I'm de starting to develop, to develop some of my own ergonomic issues. And so I'm going to take some time to explore alternative treatments and educate myself on avoiding surgery. Well, good for you, Cindy. Oh my gosh, every time I see this picture, I just want to snuggle them. And, and man, your why is so powerful, so powerful. Well, my why, it was my previous life. This was me. I used to be nuts. Well, some of my friends on here, like Lil, right? I know you still think I'm nuts, but this is my <laughs> previous life. So this is me jumping over big things. And if anybody's ever ski skied in Crested Butte, Colorado, and there's a little run off the North Face and there's a little jump, it's called Waterfall. This is me hucking off Waterfall. And so I don't do that anymore. I let my daughter do that because the why behind the reason I had to give up full-time clinical practice, yep, that's me. That's spinal injury. That's a fusion, C4, 5, and 6. That's, those are my actual x-rays. No, it doesn't go off when I go through the TSA line. <laughs> but this forced me into early retirement. And man, I went kicking and screaming and it was unavoidable. So I hope through what we talk about tonight, with Cindy and I share information with you, this will help you avoid what Cindy and I have gone through. This statement has always spoken to me. And by the way, that picture is a view from my little town in Southern Colorado. Those are my mountains. So anyway, you didn't come this far to only come this far. Our profession has stepped up to adopt all of the infection control changes and, and I've been so proud of us um, because they've just been put upon us. We really didn't have much of a choice. And the changes were to protect the health and safety of our patients. But shouldn't we also look at the opportunities to improve our personal health and our patients' dental experience? I mean, I am so impressed with those of you who readily accepted the new interim rules and regulations. But why stop there? Don't, I know that some of you have asked yourselves, are we also compromising our own health? Mm. So don't let these new regulations distract you from your career long ergonomic path. So true. This is the, I just get goosebumps even thinking of it and, and, and talking about it. 
Um, so let's start really from the beginning. This is the best definition of ergonomics that I've ever seen because I think it's easy to understand and it's easy for us to picture this. It is finding the best possible match for the greatest number of people by adapting the product to fit the user. We are the user, you all. We are not the product. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we usually do it the other way around. We usually... Um, adapt ourselves before we change anything else. But that is what results in workplace injury. Um, in 2012, I conducted an ergonomic survey and I, some of you may have taken it. And if you did, I, I will still thank you. And it was with one of my ergo mentors, Anne Guion. We were shocked at the number of respondents, um, over 1,200 in less than a three week period. And it covered 47 states and six different Canadian provinces. And then we presented the results um, at a poster session at ADHA. And that's what this is a picture of. I know you can't see the results, so let me share them with you. Oh, sorry. Look, at, happy oh, to good. finger. That's what you're happens good. when you go live. <laughs> no, you were good. That's, I wanted to go there. You were exactly perfect. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the injury rates um, vary from study to study, but this, these are what we had with those 1,200 responses. 51% said one or more that, that, that they had one or more injuries, and 19% said that they were getting worried that they might be getting hurt. And to me, that just means that 19% just hadn't gotten a diagnosis yet. Really, I believe we got that it's a total of about 70%, uh, which is exactly what we have been seeing um, in some of the other studies, about 70% injury rate. Exactly. These are some of the primary injury sites. And tonight we're going to discuss the first three, the neck, the shoulder, and the hands. We'll, we'll talk about both hands actually. So let's move on to the shoulder injuries. If you review these numbers, you will see, well, that the, sh first of all, they, um, the shoulder injuries are about double within the first 10 years of practice. With in less than under one year of practice, we, they were reporting 18% were reporting injuries. When we got to those that have been practicing for six to 10 years, it was up to 35%, so almost double. But I will tell you that we actually found this to be true for almost all the injuries that were reported to us in the study. So the first 10 years seemed to be the most important time. Thank goodness we're getting to them early, right, Cindy? Right. <laughs> Which Absolutely. I would have known this for 30 years ago. <laughs> and the thing I would like to share also is that these are people who did not have the advantages of some of the products that we have now. So it's my hope that these numbers are just going to continue to get less and less because we do, we do have a lot more offerings to us right now. So just um, some of the, the studies have reported that the hand and wrist injuries were even more prevalent in the region in, uh, for dental hygienists. I've seen them up to 60 to 69%, but these are the numbers that we got for hands. Wow, 36% in the dominant hand, oof. And I, I am the opposite. My problem is in my non-dominant hand. Also 14% for elbows, 10% for forearm, 20% for thumbs, and 16% for fingers. Ouch. I read these and I know I've seen these a hundred times, right? When we put this together and it still makes me cringe when I look at those numbers. It makes me sad. Mm. So this is an assessment worksheet and it was developed at Cornell University and Cornell is very well known for its ergonomic degree program. It's, um, so this worksheet is used to determine the potential for developing workplace injuries. So I'm just going to run through it kind of quickly, but basically the candidate answers a number of questions regarding the position of their upper extremities, their fingers, their trunk while they're working. There's actually on the side where I have that picture, there's actually more questions regarding the lower extremities, but that's not what we're dealing with tonight. So I, I've covered that up with a, one of the beautiful pictures of the hygienist that, 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 was, that was sent to me. So I can tell you that I have never administered this assessment test to any dental professional except myself on a good day who ended up with a, co a composite score of less than six or seven. That in and of itself is scary. And it just goes, it, it just, it's like so many of us are hurting, right, Cindy? And so many of us have to go to work 
and say, I have to go to work and I'm still hurting, right? And I did that. I still went to work and I was still hurting. And it took a long time for me to finally accept that I better go get this checked out. Right. So I took your survey. I was one of that. And yep, I was right up there in those numbers. So this is a study. Well, there are several studies, but the majority of these studies come to the same consensus about muscular skeletal injury. And so the definition of a muscular skeletal disorder is called injury over time to muscles, bones, nerve, tendons, and ligaments. That's Neil, Neil Gehrig in 2018. And this one study found that over 70% of dental hygienists miss work due to some kind of injury. That's huge. I was one of that. I'm in that percentage. Here are some symptoms of if you're experiencing them. And I bet, Cindy, if we were in a room face-to-face -face <laughs> with these people, the hands would be popping up and people would be going, yeah, right on, that's me, I have that, absolutely. So yeah, if they could do that. If they, if could, they could do that, right? If they could raise their shoulder, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but think about these, so, so y'all out there in, in um, video land, think about these. How many of these symptoms do you experience every day? And now, when they tell us, in clinical hygiene that we can't use power, how many are experiencing more and more? So some of the physical signs, decreased range of motion. So it's like now I drive along, I can't turn my head all the way to the left or to the right. I feel like I'm 90 years old some days if I don't do my stretching and exercising. Deformity, you know, the dowager's hump or from the forward head tilt that Cindy's going to talk about, that, that hump on the neck. I can, I can walk through a crowd and if I see someone like that, my first thing is they're in dentistry. Decreased grip strength. And I, and I tease Cindy all the time, like, thank goodness we have strong men because I have a hard time opening cans anymore. And I'm an independent female. <laughs> right? Loss of muscle function and dropping objects. Ooh and impaired tactile sensitivity. So let me address the dropping objects, Cindy. I know I've told you this story. So I'm in my private practice in Crested Butte, Colorado. It was called About Face Dental Hygiene, the first in the county. And I'm working on a client and I dropped my scaler in her mouth because- Our worst I, fear. Oh my goodness, thank goodness it was my cousin. And she just sat there all doe-eyed and I said, don't move, I'll get it. And, she, <laughs> and I'm like, please don't sue me. <laughs> And it was, it was horrible. So these physical signs, I experienced every single one of them, except deformity, <laughs> but every single one of them. And when we talk about the signs and symptoms, like I look at this and go, man, mine came screaming, Cindy. They came screaming at me. For some of us, we miss the whispers. We don't, probably because we don't even know that they are whispers for us, um, that we did, because we didn't understand the risk factors of developing a muscular skeletal dis disorder. The risk factors are forced movements, forceful movements, like a pinch grip, an awkward posture, having insufficient time to recover. We need to have at least 30 seconds in between each task to give our muscles a break. And by that, I don't mean picking up a scaler I mean, putting down the scaler and then picking up your, your, your profi angle. That is not giving yourself a break. That, even though they're two different tasks, you need to give, we're using the same muscle, so you need to give them a break. And what I would do is I would, I would scale an area with, when I was finished with that instrument, I would put it down and then I would ask my patient a question of, so, so tell me what type of toothbrush are you using? Give them a chance to answer. And then I would continue on, pick up the next instrument. Of course, I can keep talking to them, but that was just enough time to give my, my hand muscles enough of a break in between each, each task. And, um, what, I'm, what I was saying now before is that we do have answers to, to reply to the whispers. There are now products and systems that out there, instruments, seeding, all kinds of things that are actually preventive and some of them are even therapeutic. So we need to pay attention to, to those whispers and then respond. Because as Edie has said, by the time you get to where your body is screaming at you, most likely the answer is surgery. And I would like to tell you all that they do not put Humpty Dumpty back together again to put them back up on that wall. Many hygienists think that they will burn themselves out until they just have to have surgery and then they will come back to work again. But a very good study showed that 67% after surgery 
return to the same job, but 15% are required to get an entirely new job. So don't, don't, count on, don't count on that to be the answer. And another study said that, for instance, with carpal tunnel surgery, only 41% received complete relief of that system, of the symptoms. 45 received moderate relief and 14% received no improvement whatsoever. Now that hand in the middle is a friend of mine. Um, and I know for a fact that she is one who received no improvement whatsoever after her carpal tunnel surgery. Mm. And Edie, don't you know that person? <laughs> I do. Right? <laughs> I do. Excuse me. I just got a tickle in my throat. Yes, I do. So that young lady on the upper left is one of my dear friends. I was uh, blessed, en blessed enough to be a 2013 Sunstar Award of Distinction recipient with this young lady. She's my purple ring sister. This is Stacey Deemer. She had, was active in hygiene, active in education, and she went from whisper to scream like overnight, Cindy, and it ended her clinical career. So there's a lot of us out there with that. And so Stacy's, I don't think she's on this one, but she'd probably be cringing going, you really put that picture of me in there. <laughs> so here's another interesting study. And this study looked at men and women working side by side, performing identical repetitive tasks. And what they found is there were higher muscle activity working postures and movements were similar between the genders, but the researchers found that women, we had higher muscle activity, more MSD complaints, more actual diagnosis of injury, musculoskeletal disorders, and in most in the hand and elbow. And it, it's scary, but, and interestingly, the researchers found that housework, personal recovery time, and exercise had only a slight effect on the risk for injury. So we are in, the, we are in a, an industry that is, we're setting ourselves up for industry if we don't take care of ourselves, y'all. So now the next few slides are all going to look kind of similar, different pictures, but I want you to watch the box. So on your video or your screen, it might be purple, it might be blue, but it's the blue box that has the three different sets of bullet points with different colors. So the top pink ones, the first section is the description of the syndrome. The second are the symptoms and the last is the treatment. Now pay attention. <laughs> Most treatments are similar and usually end in surgery if you wait too long. So I'm not going to read through every bullet point. We'll just highlight them and you again feel free to take a picture and I'm sure a lot of you are going to say, yep, I've experienced that or yep, I'm having that right now. Thoracic outlet syndrome. So this can be caused by the frequent reaching, stretching upward. What do we do day in, day out? Dennis, hygienist assistants. What do we do? We reach for that light. Oh my goodness, we reach up and down for the light on our chair. And so Cindy will talk about, we're gonna get into um, the tripod of ergonomics. I'll talk about that. When I finally took my light post off my chair because I relied on my headlamp and my loops, my right side started to calm down. And as you can see, arm pain, tingling, arm grip, weakness, and then the treatments. Trapezius myalgia. Well, this one is pen pain, tenderness, spasms, and it's again, elevated arms, side holding mirror. So think of I'm a right-handed hygienist. So my right hand reached up for the light, but my left hand was in static muscle contraction because I was retracting. This is the way I used to practice, changed how I practice, right? And so I would have pain on my left side as well. Look at the treatment, rest, neutral posture, condition, uh, posture, physical therapy, chiropractor, right? So hopefully we don't have to move to surgery on that one. Now ro rotator cuff nerve impingement. And it is sustained repeated shoulder muscle activity, arms over and above your shoulder. Again, reaching for that light, shifting that light, causing pain, weakness. And again, look at the treatments. Tendinitis, overuse of excessive strain. I bet you most everybody on this webinar tonight, Cindy would say, yep, yeah, I have that. Would you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> right? Absolutely. The pain, the tenderness, the tingling, numbness, smelling, not smelling, <laughs> smelling, well, it could smell because <laughs> it stinks when it hurts, but <laughs> stiffness, right? And this is, um, 
if you think about this and what this can be causing with our hands, it's that forceful grip. It's that hanging on. Don't take my instrument. Do not take my scalar from me. Do not take me that away from me. And I remember the first time I became aware of forceful grip, Cindy, when I was learning ultrasonic, micro ultrasonic techniques. Long after I had graduated from an amazing dental hygiene school in Michigan, Fair State University, go dogs. But I took an ultrasonic course and my instructor, Nancy Miller, came behind me and she said, why are you gripping that ultrasonic so hard? And I'm like, Bec because I don't know. I think that's what I'm supposed to do. And she's like, Edie, relax your grip. So repeated forceful grip, and we'll get into this, can be caused by uh, inadequate hand scalers too. Epicondylitis, oh my goodness, pain near your elbow, tenderness, numbness, tingling, swelling, and again, repetitive motions, pulling, forceful grip. This can all happen. It's like you hit your funny bone and it's not funny. <laughs> right. Right? And, and Raynard's syndrome, I'm sure quite a few people have this. Painful spasms of the blood vessel, persistent blanching of the fingers. It's the coldness, right? These are the places that are affected by it. And look at the... Um, what causes them? Excessive vibrations. Excessive vibrations. We don't have vibrations in dental hygiene, do we, Cindy? <laughs> Not at all. Tenosynovitis, right? And this, this is really, really common. And again, look at what one of the causes are. Repetitive, awkward motion. Forceful grip. Repetitive, awkward motion. Do you see the pattern? All the same. Oh and, and so is the treatment. Always. And then the treatment, always the same always the same. Carpal tunnel. Yep. I bet the hands, if the kid raised them, would go up or the nods would be going, yep, I have that. Yep, I have that. And so it's the compression. And again, look at the treatment. I can't tell you how many of my friends have had to go through carpal tunnel syndrome treatment surgery, and it, they never recover fully. So it's, it's pretty sad. Trigger finger, same thing. Painful finger. Um, Progressive fibro fibrosis of the flexor tendons, and it requires surgery. Surgery, surgery, surgery. But in reality, pain can be deceiving. So we can have pain originating um, from another site, and the symptoms show up someplace else. So remember when I said I dropped my instrument, my hand was hurting? Well, that drove me to an orthopedic surgeon, and that's when they discovered that I had degenerative disc disease in my spine which prompted a spinal fusion, C4, 5, and 6, which I showed in the beginning. And that was that issue radiating to my hand. So hand issues can be derived from, oh my goodness, posture, chiropractic, posture, stretching, repetitive motion. We know that. Um, so chiropractors helped and saved me, but surgery was my end result. And so when we talk about ergonomic solutions, Ergo solutions are multifactorial. I, I love to call it the tripod of ergonomics. And if you've heard me do my dental implant lecture, you, talk, you hear me talk about um, the trifecta of implant maintenance, right? So tripod of ergonomics. What are you looking through? What's your magnification and illumination? What are you sitting on? And what instruments you are using? That tripod right there drives your ergonomic health. And ergonomics the solutions are multifactorial. So one leg of the tripod are your loops and your lights. I don't know what I did or how I practiced. I probably wouldn't have wanted to been my patient prior to me discovering loops, Cindy. <laughs> because <laughs> oh, when the loops and lights went on, it was like, what? That's what I was missing? <laughs> I was just going to say, loops and illumination should always be together. Those should be like one word. One word, exactly, one word. And it, it, we know that the benefits of them are career longevity. But I caution you, my, my, anybody wearing loops, my dentist, hygienist, assistant, whoever is wearing loops, they are not one size fits all. So if you walk into a practice, I remember temping in a practice. I'm sure you've had this experience, Cindy, and my hygiene tribe out there tonight. Walk in and they're like, yeah, hey, Edie, you don't have loops with you. Um, if you don't have loops with you, you can wear these. This is, these are Cindy's. She was our last hygienist. And I'd, I'd look at him and say, <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> My eyes aren't like Cindy's eyes. My, it, it, the pupillary inner distance and the declination angle and all these things, your loops are customized or should be for you. And I encourage you. I'm going off track, Cindy, but I promise I'll bring myself back. I'm encouraging you, my hygiene crew that's listening. 
Invest in yourself. Own your profession. Don't wait for somebody to buy you magnification and, and illumination. Your loops and your lights are with you. They go with you from start to finish. I'd say the same thing about your instruments and your saddle stool. <laughs> but, but loops and lights go primarily. with you. Right, Cindy? Primarily, primarily. And so see, I think this is from your survey, Cindy, from your 2012 survey about how many would not work without loops. Exactly. And the, the responses were that it's nearly identical. They wouldn't work with either of them. So, so I encourage people to try to not decide which one you should get. I, I realize there are some financial restrictions, but they, a lot of companies will offer you um, payment programs. And so I would encourage you to start at the top, at least when you go out looking, look for both of them. Amen to that. And so remember, I, I think you got, if you remember, I took the light pole off my chair because I didn't want to reach up for the light because I had such, I could see more clearly <laughs> with proper illumination. Because and there's no shadows with there, illumination because the no light shadows. is right in the middle of your head. So it's not coming in from the right or the left. So it, it, it gets rid of the shadows. And it goes where I'm looking, right? right? And my clients loved it because they put their safety goggles on and there was no light blurring in their eyes. So it was, it was awesome. So, I remember this day, Cindy Licious. We were, we were at a trade show and Cindy sat down. I'm like, oh, 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 Cindy, this will be great. Let me take a picture of you. So she sat down and she tried on these loops and you can see the difference in angulation um, of her neck. See the red and the green line and her working distance. So Cindy, do you remember this day? So I kept, I, it was actually quite comfortable because I have a forward head tilt to sit at a, at, in a position that had me at a greater than a 20 degree forward head tilt. It was comfortable because that's what my muscles were used to, but it was not safe. It was dangerous for me to continue in that position. So I had pictures taken of me to, I was trying to get my ear over my shoulders to get into that less than a 20 degree forward head tilt. So it actually, by the time I got measured in the right position, it actually was not comfortable for me, but I used my loops kind of as a therapeutic measure to keep me, to make me pull my head back and stay in that position. Absolutely. And what I learned from this, and I started to do with a bunch of friends is we, we developed a buddy system. So we would do this, like I did with Cindy, right. sit down, right? Pick up, if you want through the lens, pick them up. Look, get, get in your position, I take a picture. I am a huge flip up fan. I don't like lenses mounted on my, my loops because I need a really steep declination angle and I can only get that through my flip ups. And so take pictures of you guys when trade shows open up again <laughs> or call your reps and come in, right? And take pictures and try them on because not one size does not fit all, right Cindy? And in contrast, I am just the opposite. I like through the lens um, because uh, it, I, I have more clarity. So I'm just grateful. That's the best thing about the products we have. It, made, there are so many choices now that it will fit. Everyone can choose their own. So it will be customized. Your ergonomic journey is going to be customized. Just my, so this is a perfect example of how Edie's journey is different than mine. Exactly. And now we move into the, uh, the uh, opposite side of the tripod of ergonomics and we talk about chair selection. So my girl, Cindy, whoo, she changed my world when I learned about saddle stools. What I, let me rephrase, when I learned about quality saddle stools that fit me. Because what I was taught when I got us out of hygiene school and my daughter would tease me saying, mama, were the dinosaurs roaming when you were in school? And I'm like, no, babe, they were dead. But what I learned, which so many of us did, is our thighs should be parallel to the ground, right? Thighs parallel to the ground. Well, think about that. Put yourself in that position right now in my video world. Go ahead, put yourself in that position and, and, and sit there. What that does is it closes off the blood flow. So you want your slips, your, your slips, <laughs> your hips slightly elevated beyond parallel because you don't want to restrict blood flow. So for any of my friends who are uh, people out there who are equestrians, this reminds me of sitting in a saddle. I'm a huge equestrian, right? So this is ideal. We want to sit in decline. 
decline. So it allows for forward and upward posture and that will transfer some of the body support to the feet. Because as Cindy taught me, we want our bones to support us, not our muscles, right, Cindy? Absolutely, because muscles fatigue, bones do not. Exactly, exactly. And when we're, when we're forced to go into a treatment room and sit in a chair, because that's what's there, it's not taken into consideration that, hey man, we come in all shapes and sizes and our workplace is usually set up for a one size fits all. I love this picture because on the left, that's my, one of my dear friends on her huge horse, she's short. And then that's another friend who's super tall on my daughter's little pony. And then the right picture, that's my daughter up on that big, huge horse. So one size does not fit all. And we are made to um, fit into old. And Cindy teaches me the Goldilocks principle, too hard, too soft, just right. It's, there's not one, rise, one size fits all even for saddle stools or chairs, just like mag magnification. It is so important to have a saddle that can adjust to your personal physical needs. It must work for your body. And these are some of my favorite crown seating saddle stools. And so Cindy, when somebody tries a new saddle stool, what would be your recommendation? Just as this says, um, give it a chance. You're gonna be concentrating on the fact that it's a whole new, um, different seating system and you're wondering did I spend uh, too much money am I really going to like this but give it a chance because saddle soreness is a real deal and you need to you're going to be using different muscles than you're than you are used to so I always recommend to alternate with your previous stool May, maybe start off in the morning in your saddle stool and then finish in the afternoon in your old traditional chair that you're used to and do this for a couple days maybe the first week or so and i mean it's the same as with magnification there's always a learning curve to it but but give it a chance exactly you will, you will be playing just like the gal on this on that video <laughs> right i love that video i could watch that all day it's hypnotic right so as we are now reopened and we used to be called non-essential ha we are essential. We are essential. And we were told that we weren't. And we were only, we were told just scale, nothing else. And when I heard that, my initial reaction was, oh my goodness, how can we go back to something that has become the final, that's my final instrument, right? I was power, power, power. And I picked up my scalers, my super sharp, super slick scalers, as my explorer from my fine tune, that was my last step, fine tune selective scale. And now we're being told in this crazy, man, if I never have to say COVID-19 again, Cindy, I'll be a happy woman, right? <laughs> and so we're told that this is all we can do. And all instruments are not designed alike. They're just not. And we finally are looking at um, instruments that are designed not only for our comfort, but also for our patient's comfort. So think now, we have trained our patients in a new way. When they come in to have their oral health care appointments, notice I didn't say cleaning because we're not mouth mains, right? Their oral health care appointments, they're used to us picking up power and, and they really don't like to be scaled. Right now, I have some that said, don't be putting that power on me. Just pick up that scraper, Edie. And, you know, we all have those. But now we have to think in a different way. And we have to think of instrumentations just like magnification, illumination, and saddles. And Cindy, this is your term, and we now call it? Dental neutral. <laughs> so the definition of neutral position is when the bones, the muscles, the joints, tendons, ligaments are all in their strongest, most stable position. And there is dental neutral for every joint in our body, starting from the top all the way down. And I'm going, and I understand that we cannot stay in neutral position all the time when we are, when we are performing the prophylaxis. I, I get it. I, you know, I've done it for 40 years, as I said, but we need to try to make this our new normal. We need to try to achieve it for as much time as we possibly can 
in order to reduce um, our, uh, the possibility for developing musculoskeletal disorders. So what is neutral position for the neck? As we already discussed, is to have your head, uh, less than a 20 degree forward head tilt and your ears should be aligned with your joints. And remember, this is not just what we're doing during our clinical time, y'all. Think of all the time we are spending with our head bent in a forward posture while we're looking at our devices. So it is life plus our clinical time. It all adds up together. So I wanted to share this quote um, from Dr. Renee Calliette, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But the head in forward posture can add up to 30 pounds of abnormal leverage on the cervical spine. That means an extra, when you bend, it is like having an extra 30 pounds pulling your head forward just because you're in that forward head position. And that can pull the entire spine out of alignment. They, have also, they also have discovered that a forward head posture may result in a loss of 30% of vital lung capacity. Oh. Let's think about that for a minute during this time. This is why you must continue to move forward with your ergonomic journey because we're in compromised times right now. Your lung capacity is already crit critically reduced because of all the new PPE that we wear. So, so we do not need to compromise it any more than we already are doing. Okay, so what does a normal posture look, look like? A normal head tilt? Well, um, that's on the, the left-hand side of the screen, as you can see with that green line. What does too much forward head tilt look like? Well, if we could be in person to see each other, I wouldn't even have to have a picture up here. I could just turn to my side and show you. <laughs> <laughs> This picture on the left is the, a lateral, my lateral x-ray that was taken just last week. If you will look, that really thin red or maroon line is where my neck is positioned. And that blue line behind it is kind of like a plumb line. That's where my head is supposed to be. So within the next 52 weeks, we are going to be trying to move my, my head backwards by about an inch and a half. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm up for it. Yeah, you can do it. I'm up for it. <laughs> okay, so that was the neck. What does dental neutral look like with the spine? We all know this. We all know we have three curves in our back. We need to maintain those curves. And by maintaining it, we have proper alignment of the vertebrae and the discs. And we have um, even pressure uh, in between those discs, uh, uh, the intervertebral disc. So it's all things that we know. This is all neutral position. And think back, y'all, to when you went to school. How many times while, while we were in dental hygiene school did you hear, sit up straight, sit up straight? And what did we do? We lifted our shoulders up and went, oh, yeah, I'm sitting up straight. Mm -hmm. Lifting your shoulders up is not neutral position. Neutral position is when you squeeze your shoulder blades down and back, like you try to touch your shoulder blades. Um, we can't do that, but that is that. I'm doing it. I'm stretching. Yes. See, <laughs> when, I, when, we're nor when I'm normally presenting this presentation in person right now, I start seeing people start shifting in their chair and rolling <laughs> their shoulders to get, because they suddenly realize that there's, they're, they're feeling the pain. Yeah. And also, as we said before, your shoulder, um, your ear should be aligned over your shoulder joint. That is neutral position for your shoulders. Neutral position for your knees. Edie spoke about this a little bit when she talked about saddles, about the saddle stools. It is with your knees slightly lower than your hips. And the popliteal arch should be greater than 90 degrees. The popliteal arch is right there um, behind your thigh. So open, as Edie said, it is an open position. It is not closed. We know this too, for your elbow neutral positions, they should be at your side and your forearm should be nearly parallel to the floor. It's actually considered neutral position if you are even five degrees ab above parallel or five degrees below. Oof. And pay attention to this. I mean, remember some of these later on. For your wrist, we know this. You want to reduce the amount of time we're twisting and we want to avoid sustained flexion bringing our hands up too high or too low. And for our hands, again, pay attention to this later on when we get to the instrument studies. 
neutral position for your hand is when there's a reduced force grip and a reduced muscle load or a pinch grip in your hand. When our hands, the reason we're pushing so much for neutral position is because that's where we have 100% of our hand strength. When we start bending or flexing from side to side or up or down, you can see how much strength we lose in our hands. And right now, when we're doing hand scaling, we need as much strength as we possibly can because as we have all said, we're, we've lost, um, at this point, we've lost the use of our power. Some, I will tell you, some states have allowed it. It is, it is in Colorado, it is in our, in our public health notice that we can use it, but we have to be restrictive as to when and where. Right. So I, I am aware that there are some states where people can use it. Right. Um, so, and OSHA mm -hmm. has said that anytime we have more than 1800 um, flexions or extensions in an hour, we are increasing our risk for musculoskeletal disorders. So it's, mm -hmm. it's the real deal guys. And, and hand, oh, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead, Edie. And hand instruments, dental neutral solutions for hand instruments. Obviously, we love our double ended. We're looking for balanced handle, a larger diameter handle. Now we're not talking mondo huge. We love <laughs> textured non slip surface, but sharp. We want sharp, right, Cindy? Sharp instruments means less um, repetition. Yep, and that's what's so important about it. Um, I, I, I didn't say at the beginning, I think it actually was written, but I am a certified ergonomic assessment specialist in addition to being a hygienist, which means that I am certified to go into dental offices or situations, it doesn't have to be dental, but I have um, honed it down to dental, to go in and assess the situation, the working environment for the risk of developing muscul musculoskeletal disorders. And these are all the ergonomic principles that I look at when I go into those offices. But Tonight, we're just going to um, concentrate on force demands because that's part of what the study was done, that was done, the current studies that Hugh Friedi has provided for us. And it's um, force demands for both the operator and the patient. Which brings us to the Harmony Scaler. Right, so in the Harmony Scaler designed with True Fit technology, and I love this relief for your hands down to a science. And Cindy's going to go through and talk about the science now. So the Hufridi group wanted to establish factorial parameters regarding that pinch force and the pressure on the tooth, um, so that they could, and then they were going to use that to develop the ideal handle design for an instrument. And it was done in kind of like three phases or, 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 or portion, portions. And it, it took a number of years, right, Edie? I mean, you were involved in it long before I knew about it. Yep. It was exhaustive. It was really cool, actually. <laughs> so for the initial preference studies, over 50 hygienists um, spanning continents and countries around the world were asked to participate in the handle design testing. A large selection of handles were chosen from all of the current ones that are available global in the global market. Um, so they use that as the starting point for their research. And again and again, it involved designing and testing and revising until, a, 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 until a single um, instrument was, with all the features, was chosen. And features that showed the strongest influence um, were taken out. And, I mean, excuse me, were continued on. But the, one, the elements that didn't perform were removed from the from from the design immediately. So this step-by-step -step process of test, of design, test, revise, allowed them to make a really fast progress on the key factors of that pinch force and that reduced pressure on, on the tooth. The Hufridi group pioneered this thing called true fit technology to address um, the needs for scientific evidence in, in ergonomics. They developed the sensory-based technology system and it involves a sensory glove and a sensory typodont to measure the pinch, fo pinch force in our fingers as we scale. And then the resulting pressure, also the resulting pressure that was then applied to the patient's tooth. And as that slide said, the device collected 2.8 million data points. So they, they, they really looked into this in depth. Um, and they did this with this 
um, sensor technology. So this first picture on the left side, it's a picture of the sensory glove that they designed. And most importantly, they decided that they needed it to not interfere with the performance of the operator. They wanted, because do, uh, previous studies had added a sensor to the scaler, but they felt that that changed the scaler's natural form and maybe it was affecting the results. So the weight too, which right. is an integral part of it, yeah. So in this glove was embedded small sensors from all sides. So it basically captured how much and where the pressure is being applied while, while we're scaling. And that pressure was capable of being measured to 0 0.01 PSI. So that gave them the capability to detect pressure that is applied during our fine motor skills. Like even when we roll the instrument on the sides of our fingers, they were able to tell how much pressure was, was being applied. So then in that middle picture, that demonstrates how the measurements were taken when the pressure is applied to the tooth during scaling. So they embedded those same um, torque sensors into the typodont teeth. And again, because the Hufridi group insisted that the, the design of this study be duplicated from person to person, um, and not only in the oral, in, but not, excuse me, they insisted that it be duplicate, not only the same oral environment that we work in, but they also wanted it to be duplicated from um, at the same clinical environment that we work in. So they wanted no changes whatsoever in the way we, people would grasp the instrument or operate receiving. They didn't want any of that to interfere. And that last picture showed the software. Um, and it's, the software showed that uh, video images so they could capture they could see that where the pressure was being applied it, it, it was amazing to me you all it captured 40 measurements per second from both the glove and the type of dot I mean I'm impressed with this science so, uh, I, that's it, why I'm taking so much time on it yeah it was it was it was mind-blowing Cindy absolutely mind-blowing that that a company would take the time to invest in this because this was not inexpensive, y'all, to invest in this because they wanted the best and they wanted to look at it from a different point of view and um, and really back it up with data and with science. And they did. They hit a home run. And I said it earlier, and I think it bears repeating. Dentistry took a backseat to COVID initially. Yep. No doubt about it, but science is going to move us forward. Um, I, I just think science is, we're going to come out ahead in the end on this, even though we had to, we had to sit out for a little while. Yep. So first of all, <laughs> as an ergonomist. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> I know. I, I wish I could just jump into that slide and push that operator's elbows down alongside of her waist. <laughs> But um, anyway, again, this is just kind of a repeat that they were looking for fact, not fiction. They wanted to make sure that the glove adapted to all users' grasps and all the different scalar designs. And they didn't want to interfere with the practitioners um, or the operator uh, uh, instruments being tested. They wanted to duplicate the process for equally for each participant. But most importantly to me, they wanted to build and grow a database for an ergonomic application. So now we have a scientific baseline for future studies, anytime involving the performance of instruments. We have a, a place to start from now that, that is based on science, not just personal preferences. So cool. And this was the result of the scientific studies, this harmony instrument. Um, they, they're, they say it's true harmony between you, your hand, and your scaling experience. I love it. I just, I love it. <laughs> Um, so to continue on with, this, with their, uh, the results of their studies, to keep a scientific perspective and an accurate representation of the data that the Hufridi group worked with a third party um, global renowned research and analytic firm. And um, they, they assessed it, they assessed the data without bias to determine you know, the, the statistical relevance. Gosh, I'm so glad I don't have to do stat statistics anymore. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that independent research firm um, who collected and analyzed all of the data, they had no idea which instrument came from which company. As it turns out, the Harmony instrument performed the best with regards to the amount of pinch force being required um, for a successful scaling event. 
So um, it is used as you could, I'm gonna talk a little bit more on that, Edie, if we could stay on there just a little longer. So they use harmony as the baseline in this chart. And you can see that it resulted in anywhere from 51 to 65% reduction in for pinch force when they compared it to the top four competitors' instruments. That's huge. Huge. This one and, is, oh, I love this one. And this chart demonstrates uh, similar results with regard to the amount of pressure being exerted onto the patient's tooth, contributing to the patient's comfort. It resulted in anywhere from seven to 37% reduction in pressure on the tooth, again, when compared to the top four competitors' instruments. So ergonomic for the operator, comfortable for the patient. That is that to me is that's that's the beauty of it, and it was so cool. So let's just go point by point. I realize we are getting pressed for time. You can tell Cindy and I get excited about this. So there are multiple points to point out that show the benefits of this. I love the reduced pressure on the tooth, uh, the reduced pinch force. These are the two things that completely stood out to me. And when I put it in my hand to practice and use it, it was, it was like a, a comfortable glove. I don't know how else to explain it, City. It was really cool. I loved it. And, and the sharpness with the Everedge is absolutely brilliant. And the sharpness matters, right, Cindy? Absolutely. Um, because of the enhanced finishing process that they use, they're um, professional artisans. They create edges that, are, are, that they have determined that they're 70% sharper out of the box when compared to their next closest competitor. That's what is being demonstrated on this, on yeah. this graph. And uh, they can be sharpened too. That's the beauty of it. And so they can be sharpened. I wouldn't want to sharpen my instruments, but he Freedy has an awesome, well, every instrument company has an awesome resharpening program. And then uh, Hugh Freedy's is called Evercare. So I encourage you to look into that. Ergonomically, I totally um, would enc encourage you to, to stop doing your own hand sharpening. Exactly. Your, sharp, save your hands, let somebody else do it. Exactly. There's, you have more productive things to do, right? And so when we talked to other people, other experts on this and informed them, they showed them the study, they looked at it. Here's what these two amazing women, um, certified physical therapists, and they specialize in upper extremities. And they, wanted, they explained the benefits of reducing pinch force and why it was so crucial, right? And what they had to say is, you can read the slide, repetitive force placed on the same muscle group causes inflammation of the muscles and tendons resulting in muscle fatigue. And increased force and duration of force results in fatigue setting in faster. We know this. Like there was one study, half of the top 10 injuries cited by Liberty, a Liberty Mutual study, I believe, were related to MSDs. And one of them being repetitive motions involving micro tasks and gripping. And inflammation of the muscles and tendons increased pressure within the hand structure, right? Remember carpal tunnel? resulting in compressed nerves causing MSDs. One ergonomic component that may contribute to the reducing of the onset of work-related muscular skeletal disorders of the upper extremities are ergonomically designed scalars. That didn't come from Hugh Freedy. That came from an independent source. And we know this, right? And so they surmise that clinicians using an ergonomically correct scalar like, like Harmony can show a decrease in muscle fatigue, onset of hand disorders, projecting out that with all of that, potentially could reduce medical costs of workers' compensation. I know when I had to go on disability, it was the hardest thing for me emotionally to admit that I could not do the task and the work. I don't want to call it a job, but my career, I couldn't do it anymore, Cindy. And that killed me. And so when you have pain, we obviously know it increases in deep there's a decrease in your productivity level and increase in work expectancy and extended career longevity when you use proper ergonomic instrumentations. And their quote was, by using a new Harmony Scaler, a reduction of biomechanical stress on fingers and hands will occur compared to the other available scalers on the market. And that's what they talked about. Independent, independent of Hugh Freedy. So we, 
as far as ergonomic solutions, as you can tell, the time is just ticking by. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't even believe it. So, so we can only give you limited answers in this one hour presentation. And as we have said many times, it's multifactorial. There are many exercises and many other products out there um, that we would love to share with you. Um, so hopefully we'll have additional opportunities to share more of these maybe in future presentations. It, but I, just, I would like to say, if this is your situation, um, there are, your ergonomic journey will not be the same as everyone else. In these situations, your ergonomic journey needs to be sharper and faster. And if this is your lifestyle, mm -hmm. I want to be you. Wow. <laughs> Live it. Well, maybe not that lower left picture, though. <laughs> We're, we're done with that, right, Sin? <laughs> Been there, done that, yes. <laughs> so, but if your lifestyle involves more neck and head and shoulder usage, then your ergonomic journey needs to be more focused to compensate for those, for those activities. Right. And so to wrap it all up and put it all together, here's our one and only Nancy Miller. She is another, I had three amazing ergonomic mentors my, my fabulous co-host here, Cindy Purdy. This is Nancy Miller. And my third is Linda Muenberg, one of my dental hygiene instructors from Fairstone. Same for me. Yep, I, I, these three women changed my life. And so this is Nancy practicing clinically. And if you look at her, her head posture is correct. She has the declined seating position. Her feet are flat on the floor. Her arms and her wrists and arms are in neutral. She has her loops and her illumination. And here's one last tip that I want to point out. She taught me to sit at 12 o'clock. Now that goes against the grain. Like everything in this picture was not what I was taught 30 some odd years ago in hygiene school. But when Nancy and Linda taught me micro ultrasonics, they taught me to sit at 12 o'clock and have the patient move. Instead of continual movement stretching, the patient moved and adapted to us. So this is Nancy Miller, who I absolutely love. And this is how she practices and this is how she taught it. That's ergonomically correct. So what's my COVID takeaway? It's this, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. This quote means more to me now more than ever before. Um, there have been and will continue to be many changes when it comes to dealing with our safety and the safety for our patients during this pandemic. And we must remain diligent in reading the science behind the solutions. Absolutely. And again, yes, we proudly thank and appreciate all, all of those, those of you who are so willing to jump right onto the front lines. Uh, you are truly the definition of a dental professional. Amen. So we want to thank you. We want to thank Henry Schein and, and oh my gosh, Dr. Severance, thank you for moderating. And Hugh Freedy, uh, we love Hugh Freedy. Thank you so much for taking the time to really dive in and, and, and create science and care about hygienists, y'all. This is awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Cindy and I are always here for you. Here's our information if you feel like if you need to reach out. Um, there's our information. Dr. Severance, back to you. Well, thank you so much, ladies. It was certainly informative from start to finish. And I know most of the questions we have are related to the new product. I don't think many have seen that. Can I ask right off the bat, is it available now? Yes, it okay. is. It just, it, we were supposed to, <laughs> it was supposed to be, um, it's previewed, it launched in Canada, and we were supposed to do the big reveal at RDH under one roof that is now ah, so. virtual. I know, but yes, yeah. it's there. It is awesome. So speak to your fabulous Henry Shine reps or, or, and get it in your hands. Great. Uh, just a couple, and I want to respect everybody's time for this, certainly yours as well as the participants. Just want to cover a couple of them. We got a few questions on results of the studies or copies of the studies, and that's available on the Hugh Freedy website, uh, www.hughfreedy.com slash harmony. Uh, you can get most of the information and the backup to the studies. And I was very impressed. I want to congratulate Hugh Freedy as well as uh, involving people like yourselves to do it. And I was most impressed with, you know, do, testing the, uh, the product or the instrumentation in a, a real life setting and not just uh, on a tabletop. So it was great seeing that. I'm so thankful you guys were involved in it. Uh, and feel uh, this is a great contribution to not only the hygiene world, but dentistry in general, because we can't do anything without the hygienists. Uh, 
We did have one uh, question when the Henry or the Euphredi uh, conducted the study on the true fit. Uh, you had some competitors listed there. The question was, were there metal handles or silicone or mixed? Do you know? Mixed. All of the above, right. Okay, good. So, so good. No, no Caparillo, I see you, friend. Yes, let's connect. I think it's Little Cap, right? Little Cap? Well, it's my Little Cap, but it's <laughs> Little Caparillo. <laughs> and you did mention, I saw on the slide too, that the Harmony seems to start out sharper than a lot of the competitors and then stay sharper, correct? Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, five times or something, the length of time? Yes, yes. It, Cindy, you want to talk to that? Yeah, it, it started off at 72% um, sharper out of the box. There's, uh, and it always stayed sharper than the nearest competitors. There was a little bit of a rise in the, um, in the competitors in that what they found is there were some burrs on the instrument um, and it got sharper after it had been used because the burrs were re removed, but it never, it, it always remained less, less sharp than, than the, the EverEdge 2.0. Okay. And uh, do you have a preference on loops? You're going to get two different responses from both of us. So That's great. <laughs> That's correct. That's uh, I, am, I am hands down. My favorite loop is Surgitel. Without a doubt, Surgitel. Um, I like the flip ups again because I like the steeper declination angle. I love their Zeiss technology and I love their hand-free illumination, their headlamp. It's on and off with just your hand so you don't have to continually touch. That's my preference. That's all I wear. And I'm going to say that things have changed a little bit with your flip-ups, Edie, in that it's very difficult to use those now with um, everybody wearing a face shield. I, um, my preference is Q-Optics, but there, there are a number of them that are good quality out there. And again, it, it's the Goldilocks. You have to go mm -hmm. and try them on and see, get fitted, get them measured. So they, you can see which works for your everybody's face is different so that you will require different angles of declination and some companies cannot get as steep as some would need and for others it doesn't matter if you don't need a steep angle of declination right so i just got to address one thing on that with my flip ups i never flipped them up they sat where they were so a shield can go over them i never touched them once i got them set i would adjust them but i never had to flip them up right so, but they're they they're out there further shield. I have both and they're out further. Some of the face shields don't fit with them. Uh, yeah. But anyway, someone just said we need a trade show. You are so right that we need a <laughs> Certainly do. And it, <laughs> if, um, yes, we do. Yeah. And one said they couldn't get to the uh, website, but I'm sure if they Googled Hugh Freedy, uh, there would yes. be a link to or Harmony. Harmony. So I would assume. we may have got yes. that. So uh, I think you covered everything. Not There's not one size that fits all on loops mm -hmm. or you know, all of the procedures we use. So get out and try it or have your sales rep come in. I'm sure yes. it certain there would be welcome to. Again, ladies, thank you so much. Final question is, ED is an acronym for what? It's not an acronym. It's my name. <laughs> <laughs> but if it was an acronym, what would it be? Uh, I, have, I don't know. It's I'll tell you. It's empowering, okay. dynamic, inspirational, oh and education. Oh, on my website. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so check yeah. them all out. I know you're all fans of these two people, and you should be or you will be now. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a great night. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you so much. We appreciate all that you do.